preventive measures may not adequately manage a pest population, and there may be sufficient evidence of economic threat to the orchard. Then, growers look at these kinds of controls, biological, cultural, physical, and chemical. They evaluate each for effectiveness and risk. Encouraging the population of beneficials, the pest's natural enemy, is an example of a safe biological control. One example of a beneficial insect would be the uh, T. pyride. Um, it goes after uh, European red mite eggs and reducing the population that way. So, you know, if you have a good T. pyride population in your orchard with European red mite eggs out there, the two can sort of keep each other in check. There are all sorts of beneficial insects that will control other insects. Um, there are predatory wasps, spiders, uh, and various mites that actually eat other mites, chase them down and eat them. Uh, and that's been sort of the, the groundswell of support for this whole IPM thing has been looking at the whole ecosystem and doing everything you can to foster a wide range of insects. An extremely effective and low-cost cultural control is the use of pheromones to disrupt insect mating. Maggot is another very uh, persistent problem for growers. Um, and particularly in the Northeast. Um, we would see that later in the year. Um, it affects the fruit itself. Um, the apple maggot is a small fly that comes in and over positions, puts its, its eggs in a fruit that's fairly large by the point they come in. Um, and those little guys hatch and you have internal damage to the fruit Sometimes you don't see that until later in the year when you're biting into it or grating it. One of the first things that we learned was that we could indeed trap them. And I've got some traps here. The first trap that Ron came up with was a croquet ball. A red croquet ball hung in the tree and we covered it with this sticky substance called tangle trap that was there to actually catch the, the flies. Looks like a pretty, if you're a female apple maggot, that looks like a pretty good place to lay your eggs and raise your kids. But that sticky coating does attract other insects and dust and leaves and deer flies and everything else. And we learned that once that thing got covered with a whole bunch of them, the apple maggots wouldn't go with it. So you had to clean them. So if you had a, several hundred of these in the orchard, I'm, I'm not a very neat kind of guy, but I would wind up with tangle trap on my hand there went the deer fly. Oh, I had to get my wallet out. It was on the steering wheel of the truck. We realized it on the doorknob of the house. That, that, it worked, but it didn't work. One of the things that we learned was, we, we were asking ourselves, so what do apple maggots eat? What do the flies eat? And it turns out that they like to lick the surface of apple leaves. So one of the offshoots of this was that we suddenly learned that we didn't need a whole lot of insecticide to control these things. And quite often a quarter rate of the recommended rate was adequate to do the job. And uh, growers are, I think, pretty uniformly drastically reduced the rate of insecticides for apple maggots. What we're using is an organic insecticide now so that these can be used in an organic orchard. This is reusable, as is the, the hanger. All you have to replace every year is this. Put that on there. Hang it in the tree, and we now have a visual and a feeding attractant so that when the apple maggot lands on there, they're going to lick it. It has an insecticide in it that will cause them to, it's not instant, but it does cause them to cease laying eggs immediately, and then they will die. And then we have an apple odor in here. The placement is important. and. I guess you have to think a little bit like an apple maggot. Um, we know they don't fly too high or too low, but typically about our height. So you have to think of an apple maggot coming in from outside, and they've got to visually see this. They've got to smell it, and then as they get a little bit closer, because it really smells like an apple orchard, then they're going to visually see this, and boom, in they go. Physical and mechanical controls kill the pests directly. Pheromone traps are examples of both cultural and physical measures a grower takes. A grower's last resort is the use of chemicals. 
IPM dictates that sprays are used only when needed for effective and long-term control. The application of sprays must do minimal harm to people and the environment. A pre-harvest interval uh, is the, the period of time that is set by EPA between when you can apply a pesticide and the harvest time. And it's expressed to us as growers typically in days. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a legal uh, thing that we have to abide by. And I can tell you that FDA is out there. We see uh, uh, FDA inspectors every year. They take samples of our fruit. Uh, they're doing their job. We'd, we'd prefer to spray earlier in the morning uh, yeah, because of the uh, lack of wind usually at, at, uh, just before and just after sunrise. The newer materials are more specific to um, certain pests, um, certain stages of development in those pests. So depending, they're much more tailored and um, they're also not as, um, typically, they're not as persistent in the environment. What Greg set there was a trap for oblique banded leaf roller. Um, early in this season, we actually, because of the warm winter, we did actually see some very early emergence of larvae, um, which we treated for with uh, Dipel, um, which is a, also an organic approved material, benign to pretty much anything other than little caterpillars that eat it um, and that takes care of them. If you can keep the scab off the leaves in the the um, short period of time between, you know, basically the beginning of the season and mid-May or late May when all those ascospores are released, if you can keep them off the leaves, then you can really cut your fungicide rates way down low for the summer. So um, the way it's applied is just via the whatever spraying equipment you're using, be it an air blast sprayer or a tower sprayer, you mix it in with water in a tank, it sends out a fine mist and, and lightly coats the leaves. And that's usually good depending on the material that will keep a protectant layer on there for, you know, for example, up to two inches of rain you'll be protected for. There again, the weather monitoring comes into effect. So you keep track of how much rain you get. And, you know, you may not have to apply a fungicide for a couple weeks if, if you have a dry period. There are a couple of challenges um, kind of coming down the pike um, in terms of materials and what we're seeing um, in terms of invasive species. Um, the materials that we use um, are much more targeted than older materials, but it's very important as a part of the process of using these chemistries to rotate uh, what are called the modes of action. In other words, the way the chemistries work on a particular pest, because with any pest population, if you're using the same mode of action repeatedly, there's always a few of those guys who make it through. And those ones that do create an, the next generation that has some resistance to that. But it is different for every grower. Um, and you know, for what works here on my farm may not work on somebody else's farm. And it does depend on a, on a whole bunch of things. And it's your, the ecology in your orchard what's next door to you. If you were in an area that had, you know, abandoned orchards all around you, you're going to have a bigger problem than I am here. Invasive species are also a big issue for a number of reasons. We have fruit and other kinds of materials coming into the country from all over the world. The most recent one is the brown marmorated stink bug, which probably came into the country in the 2005-2006 from Asia and has caused a lot of economic damage uh, in the mid-Atlantic region. We're watching out for it. We're in a worldwide economy now and we're seeing goods traded all over the place and we're just seeing uh, influxes of pests that we hadn't ever seen before.